Mrs. Mendez is a graduate of the New York City school system where she earned a high school diploma from the High School of Music and Art. She continued her education at Queens College where she earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in liberal arts and music. She went on to obtain a master's degree in social work at Columbia University. Mrs. Mendez is a world traveler having been to Africa twice in the last two years. Tonight, she will be sharing with us valuable insights into the African culture and Pan-Africanism that she gained from those trips. Mrs. Mendez speaks, reads, and writes Spanish and French fluently, and her other vast travel has led her to Spain, France, Italy, Holland, and Liberia. Presently, she is carrying on a private psychotherapy practice, treating individuals and families who have emotional problems. She also directs the Family Guidance Division of Big Brothers of America, Incorporated. In addition to all these activities, Mrs. Mendez has found time to write. Her publications on a black legacy appeared in the winter 1970 edition of the Black Caucus Journal. Her present book, The African Heritage Cookbook, will be available in bookstores soon. This cookbook is not only a compilation of recipes, but traces the origin and history of soul foods from their beginnings on the African continent during the 16th and 17th century. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please welcome a true credit to black womanhood, Mrs. Mendez. Greetings, brothers, sisters, and friends. It's a pleasure to be here with you in this week that you set aside to celebrate black awareness. This is a week when we give special reflections to the meaning of black awareness. Among its many meanings, not the least of which is an awareness of our black kinsmen all over the world, especially in Africa, the land from which our ancestors came. Out of a need to pierce the curtain of ignorance which separates us from our black kinsmen, an increasing number of black Americans have been going to Africa in recent years. I was fortunate enough to make two trips in two years to the African continent, and I would like tonight to share some of the impressions that I got. First of all, I'd like to tell you something about the kind of reactions I got from my fellow Americans, both blacks and whites, when I announced that I was going to Africa. Apparently, these people were still very heavily influenced by the movies about Africa, and they feared for me to go alone to what was to them the dark continent. They expressed a number of concerns. One was that the animals would get me. I was warned to be, to be on the alert for the tigers that might maul me or the snakes that might bite me. Other people warned me about the disease which ran rampant in Africa and they were fearful that I might contact some disease that I'd never be able to recuperate from. Still others had a special interest in the fact that I ran the risk of being eaten alive. These people apparently were still very much influenced by the cartoons and the movies of the Africans boiling people in the pots. In fact, one psychiatrist I knew went out of his way when he heard that I was going to Africa to come and warn me about this special danger. According to him, a friend of his who was also a doctor and who had worked for the Red Cross and had gone to Africa reported that there were tribes um, who suffered from a protein deficiency 
because there were not many animals in the area. Now these people lived primarily on vegetables and roots, not by choice, but by necessity. So therefore, whenever anyone came into view who looked particularly edible, they would capture that person. And according to him, because they did not have refrigeration, they had a special method of eating this person. And he pictured me sitting under a tree where the Africans would periodically come and remove either a hand or a leg for supper and uh, cauterize the wound and the next day return for an arm. Uh, he was not the only one to warn me about this, but his was the most graphic kind of warning. Still other people uh, were concerned about the language barrier. When they learned that I did not speak Swahili, they felt that I would not only go into a land of so many dangers, but I would not be able to communicate with anybody that I encountered. Of course, the most common concern was that Africa was terribly hot, and I was warned that I would burn up in the jungle. Still others who are more practical minded would say, well, the cost to go to Africa is prohibitive, and you're going to go absolutely bankrupt if you embark upon this. Well, I'd like to tell you what I found out after going. First of all, I didn't see any wild animals except those in a zoo. And these uh, were the animals on President Tubman's farm. I saw no snakes, although I heard that there were some out in the forest. In terms of disease, it is true that there are three types of uh, sicknesses or diseases that we as Westerners might be susceptible to. One is yellow fever, the other is malaria, and the third is dysentery. But there are measures that you can take to protect yourself. The government, United States government, requires that you get a yellow fever uh, vaccination. There are tablets that you take, and I took a variety which I only had to take once a week, that will protect you from malaria. And if you're careful not to eat fresh fruits and vegetables, the chances of you getting dysentery are very, very slim. And I'd like to report about the cannibals. No one seemed in the least bit interested in putting me in a pot or having me for breakfast. In terms of the language, in all the West African countries I visited, the people certainly spoke their tribal language, but they, the official language of the country was either French or English. And you can get around in any part of the country using one of these languages, depending on the official language of that particular country. In regard to the heat, I remember that after my first trip, I was looking forward to returning to Africa last year, especially when New York was in the midst of its sweltering heat. I was looking forward to it because I knew I was going to cool off in West Africa. But when we are in the heat, the height of our hot season, this is what is comparable to their winter, which feels like spring. You remember that thing we used to have a long time ago? Well, the weather there is balmy and very pleasant at, uh, during the summer months. I also learned that Africa has forests not jungles. A forest is a wooded area that has trees and bushes. A jungle has a lot of undergrowth and tangled roots and high grass. Jungles exist in India, I'm told, and I have to put it that way because that might turn out to be a myth too, but they do not exist in Africa. Also in terms of the cost, I found that by Using the commercial airline, I will have to use its name because it's the only one that I found that went directly to West Africa, and that was Pan American Airlines. The first year, I bought a ticket from New York City to the Congo, Kinshasa, and the round trip ticket was approximately $669. But Pan American has um, what they call stopover privileges, which meant that I, what I did do was to stop over in Senegal, Ghana, I went to the Congo, and then spent five days in Rome before returning to the United States. And all of this was for the same price. 
The second year, I bought the ticket from New York to Ghana, and I was able to travel to Liberia, Sierra Leone, the Ivory Coast, and Ghana, all for the same price. So it is worth your while to consider going because the cost need not necessarily be so prohibitive. Now, in terms of the things that I saw, I couldn't possibly tell you all of the exciting things, but I would like to share some of them with you. The first tropical African country that I visited was Senegal. And its capital city, Dakar, was for me a most enchanting city because it was a blend of both the African Muslim world and the modern world. You had buildings that were made of glass and steel across the street from those in the elaborate uh, Muslim style. And on the streets, you saw Africans walking about in their fez and long robes. The language of the country is French, and I found that in the beginning the Senegalese were a bit reserved with me until I showed some sign of friendliness. And after I did that, they opened up and very, were very warm and receptive and went out of their way to please. But for me, even though the city of Dakar was enchanting, the most thrilling sight was the Senegalese women, most of whom were of the Wolof ethnic group or tribe. The Wolof women are to me the most beautiful women I have ever seen anywhere. Generally, they are tall, very statuesque women who have fine features. They vary in color from coal black, and I have not seen anybody that dark in this country in a long time, to a medium brown. That these women are very stylish, but they are stylish in their own way. And they seem, although the younger girls sometimes adopt Western style clothing, and you'd see them in their miniskirts, the more traditional women hold on to their own style. The, one of the most prominent forms of their clothing is the boo-boos that you might see, these long, full robes. And they would wear this, the boo-boo might be made of organdy or some other very light material. And underneath it, they would wear what would appear to be a strapless gown of, say, a print or a contrasting color that would show through the boo-boos. And then on top of their head, they would have a hair tie that matched the organdy or the transparent uh, clothing. And since their posture was so regal, you just had to stop and watch as they floated down the street. One of the things that particularly interested me um, was their makeup and their jewelry. The Senegalese women have their own makeup, and they wear a kind of indigo blue coloring on their lips, and or they might outline their eyes with this color. And this is a very attractive color for a black person, and I hope someday that the women in this country might adopt some of this uh, cosmetics. But the thing that intrigued me was seeing the number of earrings that the women could wear at one time. I actually saw one woman wearing eight pair of earrings at one time. Now what happened was there were holes pierced around the rim of her ear, and in these holes were placed little gold, round gold earrings, and at the lobe of the ear was a huge uh, earring, perhaps of a different metal or color. So what it looked like from a distance was that her ear was etched in gold. And I must say, this was a most enchanting uh, sight. I did leave the city of Dakar to go out to the village of Kayar, which is a fishing village. And there the people lived the way they had been living for centuries. They lived in what appeared to me to be thatched huts, uh, which were enclosed uh, by thatched fences to mark off the compound. The men were responsible for doing the heavy sea fishing, and the women's job was primarily to rear the children and to smoke and preserve the fish. Um, that summer, I traveled with a Polaroid camera, which turned out to may be very corny in terms of being a tourist, but it was very helpful in many ways. One of the things that happened was that I took pictures of the people, and uh, they were thrilled to be able to see them within 60 minutes. And because the group was so nice, I gave them one of the photographs. And they were very touched by this. And they conferred amongst themselves. 
And then they had a spokesman say to my guide, in, from Wolof to French, uh, that uh, they wanted me to return on Friday because they wanted to give me a basket of fish. Now, I was puzzled. I didn't see the relationship between the fish and the, the photograph. And it turned out that they said that one gift deserves another. I had given them the Polaroid uh, photograph, and they felt that they had to give something to me in return. And so they would give me what was for them a traditional gift, which was a basket of fish. Unfortunately, since I was boarding a 20th century jet clipper that Friday, I had to decline the offering. I didn't think that Pan American would let me board with a basket of fish. Now, there was a little girl who followed me around. She was about uh, approximately eight years old, eight or nine years old. And although we could not communicate directly, we had uh, an esprit de corps. We were very attracted to each other. So she was very curious about me, and she asked the guide who I was, and we exchanged names. I couldn't pronounce hers, and she couldn't pronounce mine. Then she wanted to know where I came from. And um, so the guide turned to me and, and told me this. Well, there is no word in Wolof for America or the United States. So I said, Amérique in French, or, and that drew a blank uh, response. Then I tried to Tazuni, the United States, and then I said it in English, and still no response. So by this time, I was totally thrown. What do you mean you don't know America? So I uh, tried to show her where I came from, and I pointed across the Atlantic and said, you know, I came from the other side. Well, she followed my finger with her eyes, and she saw the sea and the sky. And then she looked back at me with a great deal of suspicion, and like she was trying to decide whether I was crazy or, or joking about having come from the sea and sky. And then when she decided that I was only joking, she laughed and shrugged her shoulder. And I remember for that moment, that was the first time I had ever encountered anybody who hadn't heard of the United States. And it was a very humbling and a good experience for me. Uh, as I said, I found the Senegalese women the most beautiful but I found Sierra Leone the most beautiful country. Now, it is beautiful because of the lush foliage uh, from the valleys and the, the hills and mountains and the lake. This is one country that you don't get bored with in terms of the landscape because there's, there seems to be such an infinite variety of the things that grow there and the contour of the land. However, the capital of Sierra Leone, the city of Freetown, appeared to me to be a rather decaying uh, city. And actually what it is, it's just that the colonialists have left it in bad condition. And, and the people have crowded into the city and are not able to repair some of the old colonial buildings. So to my Western eyes, it looked pretty bad. They are trying to build new buildings, but these are side by side with what appears to me to be, be decaying buildings. And in this country, English is the official language. And I found these people very friendly. They did not wait for me to reach out. They came to me. And they went out of their way to please me. These people, by and large, seem to be very conscious of being a developing nation. And this, too, was good to hear, because most of the time, when we Americans talk about African uh, nations or nations in South um, America, we talk about them in terms of being undeveloped, which is stressing the negative. The Sierra Leoneans refer to themselves as a developing nation, and that more positive attitude is, is contagious, and you can envision that these people might very well develop into a strong, powerful nation. It was here in Sierra Leone that I became aware of uh, the ethnic or tribal loyalties and rivalries. I think the first instance of this was when I went with a person who worked for the Planned Parenthood uh, program out into the village of Songo. Now Songo is approximately 80 miles outside of Freetown. There the people who inhabit that area are primarily of the Temne ethnic group. Now when we approached these women, and they were at a, a well baby clinic. There was a nurse who was of the Temne tribe who saw us coming and said something to the effect, uh-oh, here comes the troublemaker. 
and this was her greeting to the family worker. The, the family worker wanted to convert the Temne women to using Western-style contraceptives. And so as she got up to proselytize and talk about the wonders of the pill, she had to rely upon this nurse to translate what she said from the Creole language into the Temne language. Now, I did not understand the Temne language, but I'm sure that like me, the Temne women read the message in this nurse's face. And it was a very negative one. And I was not at all surprised when after the family worker finished her spiel, no one volunteered to come forward. When later I discussed this with people, it turned out that the Temnes are very suspicious of the birth control programs that have been introduced into West Africa and particularly into Sierra Leone. The Temnes are the largest group and in this country, Sierra Leone, there is a rule of one man, one vote. So therefore the Temne have considerable political power. They were concerned that the programs were sponsored by people of rival tribal groups who wanted to cut down on their numbers. Um, this is a concern that is not too alien from a number of blacks in this country. Now, this did not seem so far-fetched because the woman that I was with, the family service worker, was of the Creole people. Now, the Creoles, spelled K-R-I-O, are people who were the liberated slaves. Now, the, the distinction between emancipated slave and liberated slave is that um, after England had outlawed slavery, uh, they would have people intercept the ships that were leaving Africa for America, and on the high seas, they would liberate the slaves. And they took many of these people to uh, Freetown in Sierra Leone. And because these people had the backing of the British government, they had considerable uh, advantages over the people who normally lived there. And these people, since they were Africans from different uh, tribal groups, the ones who were liberated, they developed their own language, which, which is a composite of many African languages and some English thrown in. And these people began to think of themselves as the elite of the country. They were offered a great deal of educational and business opportunities, and apparently, from some of the things that I read and heard, uh, a number of the people did not prove to be so skillful economically. So in time, what happened was that other groups, and particularly the Lebanese from uh, the Middle East, came to Sierra Leone and took over the business. So with the loss of this economic base, the Creoles are like a a, the poor aristocracy of the country. And of course, with a number of people now getting education, they've lost some of the status, which they struggle still to maintain. And this whole issue of social class and structure um, and struggles was even more vivid for me in the country of Liberia. But there, the dichotomy between those who have and those who have not seemed to my eyes very extreme. As a social worker, I would naturally be very concerned about the conditions under which people lived. And I was appalled at some of the shacks in which people in the capital city of Monrovia had to live. I met a number of wealthy Liberians, and I tried to engage them in talks about the conditions of their less fortunate brethren. And this was shrugged off. The people just didn't want to get into it. Then um, someone invited me out to what he called a farm and what I call a plantation. This was a Liberian who owns 1,000 acres of rubber trees and employs 300 families, not individuals, on this plantation where he provides, in addition to a small salary, he provides housing, medical care, and food, and education also. Well, after we had traveled around this plantation and he was showing me all the things that he had, we were driving back to his house and we were about to go into the carport. And the gate was slightly ajar, which meant that he either had to get out and push the gate or to maneuver the car to get around it. Well, he did neither. Instead, he just beeped the horn and a male servant came out and pushed the gate and we drove through. 
Then <laughs> later, um, I had taken a nap, and when I got up, I went to join my host, who with two other guests were sitting across the lawn uh, under a tree. And as I was approaching them, a female servant was coming in my direction. When the host saw her, he snapped his finger and said, hey, and she apparently knew who hey was, so she turned around, went back and stood at his side until I approached them. And then he asked what I wanted, and I didn't want anything to drink, and she was dismissed. Well, I was floored, and I watched her, and I thought, well, this doesn't seem to bother her. And then I had a, an insight to how we uh, blacks must appear to those who visit the plantations of the South. You know, they said we were very happy and contented with that style of life, and if I had to judge by the face of this woman who had gone through what I felt was an indignity, um, I would assume that this didn't bother her either. Also, in terms of this, this attitude, which I consider one of contempt for people less fortunate than themselves, I remember sitting in someone else's living room and still talking to someone of the more affluent class. Actually, these people who are affluent are extremely so. Uh, the homes in, in better homes and gardens don't seem to touch the palatial places in which they live. And the young girl, who otherwise seemed very genteel and quite lovely, turned to me and she said, I understand that you're here to study the African family. And I said, yes. She said, well, who have you come to study? The superior Africans or the inferior ones? Well, when I had to catch my breath, I said, well, uh, the ones that you call superior are just like the middle class people in my country. And the ones that you call inferior are the ones who, for me, have a great deal of value and interest. And still another example of this kind of uh, attitude, but I thought in a particularly unfortunate way, is I was visiting another woman who was not as affluent as the people I just mentioned, but she was striving middle class. And we had gone out into the country to her mother's home, and her mother had a Western style home. And she said to me that she was very proud of her mother's people because they used to be, quote, savages. Um, and her mother's part of the family left the savages and became civilized and no longer have anything to do with the uncivilized part of the family. And here again, since I was in someone's home and she was talking about herself, I didn't go into, launch into, you know, what do you mean and, and the hate, self-hatred. But I was to find that uh, a number of the Africans I met, particularly in Liberia, still have this romance with the white man and with Western culture because when I analyzed on what basis they decided people were superior or inferior or civilized or uncivilized, it was based on the degree to which they had become uh, acculturated with Western ideals. And it was a contempt for their traditional way of life. And this, of course, was most startling to me as a black American, where over here we are very eager to learn about the traditional ways of our people. I also felt that we in this country are a little wiser about the romance with white Western culture and are a bit more discriminating about which parts of it we want to claim as our own. And we don't necessarily think that it is totally superior. Now, in spite of this very disconcerting uh, bit of news I've shared with you, I did find that by and large, the Liberians had a stronger sense of loyalty as a nation than the people in Sierra Leone. Now, I was told verbally and through writings that this was in great part due to President Tubman. Now, amongst American blacks, President Tubman is a very controversial figure, and I had expected this to exist in um, Liberia too. While I was there, I was startled at first and then became increasingly suspicious about the fact that everybody seemed to love him and everybody thought that he had done a fantastic job. Well, he certainly has done something for the country, but he's a human being and I couldn't believe that uh, one human being, certainly one with a lot of power, could be so universally loved. Thank you.
in spite of the fact that he might be a controversial figure, I think he's been successful in encouraging people to think of themselves beyond their tribal affiliations uh, that, and think in terms of nationhood. These people, too, are aware of and describe themselves as being a developing nation. Also, in terms of the positive, I must say, I found the Liberians to be the most friendly people. And they spoke English. And they certainly went out of their way to make my stay very pleasant and profitable uh, in terms of learning uh, the kinds of things I came to Africa to learn. It was also that I could see the strong American influence in the country. In fact, the currency of the country is the American dollar. Just as I found that the American influence in Liberia was very strong, I found that in the Ivory Coast, the French influence was extremely strong. In fact, in contrast to the other countries, I felt that I was actually in a white country with black servants. Um, once I could uh, I'd kind of adjust to that, because that was a bit upsetting, was I could really appreciate the, the astounding beauty of the city of Abidjan, the capital. It is very hard to describe this breathtakingly beautiful city, but if you can imagine the best of modern Paris, situated on the edge of a beautiful forest, you will have an idea of how Abidjan looks. I also was very delighted by the artworks that I saw in Abidjan. Now, I saw artworks in each of the countries that I visited, but I thought the mask and the wood carvings of the Baule peoples and the Senufo peoples were extraordinarily beautiful. The, uh, the people of the Ivory Coast have a museum, which I thought really was commendable in the way it was set up. Not only was it uh, very attractively arranged, but the museum provided a guide who would go with you from piece to piece and explain the anthropological cultural meaning of each piece that you saw. And he was very knowledgeable, so I learned a great deal. One of the things that particularly interested me was the fertility doll. Now, they come in many shapes, but I think the most common one that you've seen is the one that has the flat head, circular head, and the extended arms rather, that were rather rigid. Well, the fertility dolls are used in traditional society when a woman, after a period of time, is not able to conceive. Um, and what happens is that uh, her husband or someone has a doll made for her by the local woodcarver. Then she carries this doll about with her, usually tied uh, in the cummerbund that she wears. And they found that an astounding number of women get pregnant after this. I discussed this with uh, a, a woman later on, and she said that she felt that what was operative was that it was something comparable to what happens in this country when women want to have children, and they try and try, and then when they give up, and they go for and adopt a child, that they often become pregnant. It is as though something, they, they relax in some ways and are able to conceive. Uh, and the dolls play a role comparable to the adopted child. And usually after the child is born, if it's a girl, it's given that doll to play with. Now just as I saw the American influence in Liberia and the strong French influence in the Ivory Coast, I was to see the Belgian legacy in the Congo, Kinshasa. As you know, this is the former Belgian Congo, the home and death place of Patrice Lumumba. Now, I naively went at a time of political tensions. Uh, the Belgians and other European had returned to the country shortly before I arrived. I did not fully take this in when I was there, and all I knew was that People were very tense, both blacks and whites. Whenever I approached a white person, I could see the fear in his or her eye. And this fear was somewhat abated when I identified myself as an American, but it never fully went away. I found that the Congolese people, although they were very courteous, were very reluctant to discuss their country. Now, the return of the Europeans and Belgians 
grew out of the country's need for technical assistance. I met an, Austra an Austrian businessman who um, would have lunch with the people who would have, would have contact with the people who lived in the Belgian Congo for some time. And he reported that the Belgians, when they were colonialists, deliberately did not educate the Africans, did not give them the technical knowledge that they needed to run their country well. So the inevitable result was after the Belgians were overthrown and run out of the country, the Africans who did not have enough skilled people had a need for this kind of um, skill, so they allowed the Belgians and other Europeans to come back into the country. And according to this businessman, the attitude of the Europeans who would return was that they would work very hard for approximately three years, and they would leave the Congo being very wealthy men. And the attitude was, well, these people will never do it, so we might as well take advantage of this. Also for me, what was disconcerting was to see that the large stores um, were owned by white people. Uh, you might see blacks, but they were usually the clerks. Also in contrast to this, to see the African men sitting on the streets selling this exquisitely beautiful artwork and selling it at a, at a bargaining price was upsetting too, because it was like a graphic depiction of the difference in the economic status of these groups of men. I found the Kinshasa very frightening and depressing, and it, the, my fright was increased because I wasn't clear about what was going on. So as a consequence, I left much sooner than I had intended, and I was sorry that I didn't get a chance to tour into the villages to see more of this area, which I'm sure is very rich in culture. Perhaps when things are better, I will return. But it pointed out to me the extreme importance of anyone who wants to travel in Africa to check on the current political situation. Here, uh, we are accustomed to a relatively stable government, and we may not always anticipate that other people don't have this. Although I left the Congo quickly and was hesitant about returning, I did not have this feeling about Ghana. In fact, I went to Ghana twice. The first time I went, I went simply because I felt, well, I'm in West Africa, and I should drop in to see how Ghana is doing. Well, when I got there, I was very surprised, not only at how beautiful the country was, but at the feeling I had of being at home. Uh, in the style of dress and in the mannerisms of these English-speaking people, I could see the influence that they, and perhaps through Nkrumah, had on the black Americans in this country. And with our whole surge toward uh, black international brotherhood and our wearing of uh, dashikis and uh, African jewelry seemed to be very much related to the Ghanaians. I found it a very pretty country, not as exquisitely beautiful as Sierra Leone, but a very pretty country nevertheless. And I also found that it was generally better developed than any of the others that I saw. Uh, the other countries might have a, a startlingly beautiful capital city, but as you go out into the outlying areas, you would see that they were a long way from fully developing the country. However, Ghana tended to have roads, more roads going to more places than other places other countries, and you saw industry scattered around the country, and schools were scattered around the country. And I think this is one factor um, accounting for the fact that unlike many of the other cities, Ghana doesn't have a heavy migration from the hinterlands into the city, because the government has been wise enough to put the kinds of things that would attract people into the city, thus causing overcrowding, uh, out into the hinterlands so there would be better spacing of the people. I also saw books everywhere and magazines, and you certainly got the impression that these people were eager to learn and eager to move ahead. It was definitely a country on the move because these were energetic, friendly people who were very conscious of the role that they wanted to play in national politics. Now, Ghana took on a special meaning for me because I, like perhaps a number of other Afro-Americans, very curious about um, my ancestry. 
Now, I believe that it's impossible for me to know with any real accuracy who are the people I descended from. So since I can't know for sure, I feel very free to make up my own history, my own ancestry. And some time ago, when I was doing research, I came across a description of the Igbo tribe of Nigeria, who are presently known as Biafrans, by and large. And they were described as energetic, ambitious, hardworking people. Well, I like that description, so I adopted the Igbos as my ancestors. Um, the first year that I was in Ghana, I was sitting in the, uh, the lunchroom of the YWCA, talking with a girlfriend I had made who was a Ghanaian, and a woman entered the uh, lunchroom, and she was across the room from me. She saw me, and she said, ah, oh, you look just like my uncle. Well, I was very excited. This is my heritage. What is she? So I turned to my companion, and I said, well, what people is she from? And my friend said in a very dry voice, she's an Akan. Well, I didn't bother to ask any more questions, although I was very eager to do so, because my friend was of the Ga tribe, and she had already indicated that she resented uh, what she considered the undue attention which the Akan people were getting. But I knew that uh, the Akan is a generic term for a number of tribal groups, um, and it's like, say, we talk about the Latins, which encompass the French, the Spanish, the Italians, and the Portuguese. Well, the Akan group comprises a number of groups, the most elite of which is the Ashanti. So I decided I was the descendant of the Ashanti. Then uh, last year, I decided that I wanted to go back to Ghana and go to Kumasi, which is in the center of Ghana, but is really the capital of the Ashanti people. And so I took off and made these other stops, but my real goal was Kumasi. I was very fortunate that I met a doctor on the plane ov going over who offered to take me around once I reached Kumasi, and when I got there, he did do that. And to my surprise and delight, I was looking for people to look like my mother's side of the family because I was told that I resemble my mother mostly. But I was very surprised to see that I actually saw people who looked like my father and uh, looked like my brother's daughter. Now you can say this is my imagination, and it might very well be, but I can only say that I went looking for people of one side of my family and saw them looking like people from the other side of the family. And I was taken by this doctor into an Ashanti village, and one of the, uh, the Ashantis recognized the doctor and greeted us, and and as he was talking to us, I nudged the doctor and said, tell him that I want to see an Ashanti home. And he did. And the man uh, asked us to come into his home. Well, I was somewhat surprised by the, the house because it was a large house. And it reminded me of the Moorish style houses that I saw in Spain. It, the house, the front of the house had columns. It um, had an inner courtyard. Uh, and around which were the rooms, as you may have seen in pictures or if you've actually been to Spanish um, cultures. And I asked, is this a traditional Ashanti house? And I was assured that it was, and that this is the way the people have been making their homes for centuries. And in fact, in the hinterlands, they made this home of mud. This particular man was able to make it in the cement style. And then I thought, well, the Moors were black people, and they did influence uh, the Spanish culture. And who knows, there was a lot of traveling back and forth between the Sahara and the tropical countries. And it would be interesting someday to find out just who influenced who. But needless to say, I was very excited about being actually in an Ashanti village, in uh, an Ashanti home. And for me, in my romantic mood, I was on the spot from which my ancestors originated. And the man answered all of the question that I just threw at him. And also, while we were there, his wife and his daughter were in the kitchen. And the kitchen is actually an open shed. And it had small, uh, the stove consisted of small clay mounds. And between the mounds, when she would build the fire and put the pot over the fire. And I was told that the wife spoke no English, and but she greeted me by nodding and smiling. And just as I stared at everything, they stared at me. And when 
the man, when I finished asking all of my questions, I was so overcome by this whole sense of where I was and what it meant to me that I turned to the man and I said that I left New York to come to Kumasi to visit an Ashanti village and to enter an Ashanti home. And I tell you from the bottom of my heart, me dase, and me dase means thank you. And he said, but oh, it is a great honor for me and my family to have a black American visit our home. And I was very delighted with this because up until that point, I hadn't thought that they were getting something out of this too. And as we were leaving, I learned, I think the word is ntie, which is goodbye. And I said, ntie, goodbye. And the wife who spoke no English said, bye bye. And this was our international exchange. Of course, I left there feeling just fantastically great. So I have shared these things with you because I want to impress upon you that you know West Africa uh, can be an exciting, marvelous place to visit. One of the things I do want to say is that Americans often comment on the tribal rivalries that exist in uh, Africa. This is true in some areas, but if you think in terms of these so-called tribal groups as ethnic groups, and not as something that's exotic like a tribe, you can more nearly understand the kinds and the nature of their rivalry because we have it here too. We have it with the blacks and the Indians and the Poles and the Italians and the, the Jewish people. And what we've had to struggle with is to learn to live side by side. And this is exactly the kind of struggle that they have. Only these people are black and they're called uh, Wolof or Mandingo or Sere. Uh, also, I'd like to share with you the fact that not all Africans are alike. They don't even look alike. One of the things that struck me as I moved from country to country was that I could tell the difference between the people. Now, I may not have, I certainly didn't develop the skill to be able to point at somebody and say, this is an Akan as opposed to a Wolof, although I might be able to guess that. But the Africans themselves can look at people and determine racial characteristics. I found that as a general rule that the further south I moved, the lighter in complexion the people were and the shorter in stature. I don't know the reasons, but that was what I observed. Also, the people are very different in their dress. Not only do they, might they vary from ethnic group to ethnic group, but in terms of countries, as I, I felt the, the Wolof women of uh, Senegal were the most stylish. And there were some groups that I felt left much to be desired in their physical uh, attire. There was also a marked difference in their architecture with uh, some groups living in circular mud houses, and like in um, Liberia. And it was very interesting for me to see these houses, some of which had thatch roof. I did go into one such house, and it's like a small room in which there was a bed and a Western-style dresser. Um, but there was a stairway leading to a loft where things were stored. And this house, like most of the other houses I saw, had a veranda. Apparently, Africans very much believe in that. And once I stood under it, I understood it, because even in the hot season, the veranda is a very cool place to sit. It's like a long porch the, with the thatch roof coming over the top of it. The art is also different, and after you've seen a while, you can pretty much guess which people are likely to have done which piece of art. And the music is different. In fact, when I first heard Congolese music, it reminded me of Spanish music, and I was wondering why people in the Congo were playing Spanish music until I learned that it was the Congolese music. And it really had a more subtle rhythm, although it was very much uh, like this, this Spanish tango to me. And of course, the land is very different. Just going from one country to another offers you such a variety. So in spite of this very rich variety and in spite of the loyalties people have to their ethnic groups or their nations, I was surprised to note that there was a strong sense of regional identity. A number of people from the various countries would identify themselves as West Africans. Well, we West Africans do this, and we West Africans don't believe in that. And there has been some movement to unify the whole continent of Africa, but at this point it seems as though those in West Africa uh, are like getting their confederation together, and perhaps those in East Africa, I haven't yet visited them, are doing something comparable. 
I think that uh, this is especially true for the black American, that you can really enjoy your trip if you go over there remembering that you are American. You are not African. Um, it is that you are visiting the land of your forefathers, and your experiences have been very different from your sisters and brothers who remained on the continent. Um, I've met a few African Americans who were very dismayed and disillusioned because the Africans didn't welcome them as a brother or a sister. And this struck me as being rather naive because you, uh, you are very different and the difference itself can be an intriguing thing for both of you. And out of that difference you can give so much to each other and teach each other so much. Uh, I also found that, uh, as I've probably indicated, that the idea that Africans don't like Americans seemed to me to be another myth, at least in my personal experience. In fact, um, not only was I very much aware of the fact that I was an American, and I can explain this in part too, um, when I was in Europe, I was not particularly aware of being an American, and that was simply because I had gotten a Western-style education that, that was its material primarily from Europe, so there was a sense of familiarity. However, in uh, having contact with people who are from traditional groups, we did not have the same kind of orientation so that I was more acutely aware of being an American. Um, however, the interesting thing was that being an American is really something I found uh, is of a status symbol in West Africa. The people who seemed to have a romance about Americans were the Liberians, and their attitude, I think, is comparable to the attitude we must have had at one point in our history with those who came from Britain, because if you were an Englishman to the American, you were the uh, paragon of, of culture and refinement, and there's something comparable that goes on for the Liberians about Americans. I very much encourage all of you to visit the continent, especially the black brothers and sisters, but those of you who are our friends. And there is, in addition to the fact that I think that you'll get a great deal out of it, you can help by uh, going because the more of you who go, the lower the fare is likely to be. One reason why <laughs> the price is relatively higher is that there's not that much traffic back and forth. And the Africans uh, themselves are trying to encourage the tourist industry. And if you go, then this will be a spurt to their economy. And I feel that for the black Americans, through travel, you can become aware of your blackness from an international perspective. And this adds an important dimension to the meaning of black liberation, black power, and black nationhood. It gives a vital force to the whole concept of black awareness. Thank you. We very much appreciate the inspiring words that we've heard from Mrs. Mendez, and we're very grateful to you for your time and energy. I'd like to share with you uh, the book that she has written, the African Heritage Cookbook. We hope to have some copies of her cookbook available here in the Union in the Dean of Students' Office near the end of the week and later, hopefully, in the University Bookstore and in the Campus Town Bookstore. So for those of you who are interested, you can bear in mind this African Heritage Cookbook. Thank you very much. Oh, I neglected to mention that there will be a reception for Mrs. Mendez at the Black Cultural Center following this presentation. It's at 517 Welch, and everyone is invited. <laughs>